Yeah, we're back with I'm MJ Fidel, 2 p.m. This is SyncTech, and it's the military in Hawaii, one of my favorite series here on a given Thursday. And today we're talking about the U.S. Army Hawaii recruiting program uh, with our guest, who is a recruiter, Paul Francis Puakai Hui. Welcome to the show, Paul Francis. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Yeah, nice to have you here. Um, you know, um, um, we live in different Dif difficult and different times these days, you know, and yeah. although recruiting has existed, you know, for, for the history of the country, you know, here you are with a different situation. So how is the situation different for a recruiter now today in 2022? Well, with the jobs that they offer now, like with the many other like employers, they offer competitive wages and like tuition reimbursement. Uh, health care and bonuses. So it kind of like gives us a harder time to recruit people with the incentives that with the incentives that we have. So it's pretty much like we give a bonus and then the civilian side they'll give a bonus too. So it's like <laughs> they are gonna be able to compete. <laughs> They're so, competing with you. <laughs> yeah. It's really it's rough. cute. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, but I mean, are, are, are young people or any people willing to uh, recruit these days? I mean, they're willing to come into the service. Uh, I mean, are they, are they lining up at your door? Well, there's times where we have walk-ins to want to join, but like majority of the time we're out there prospecting, hitting the streets, the school is doing uh, table setups, career fairs, and it's pretty much we go out there looking for them uh, a lot of people don't know like especially like the seven, 16 17 year olds to like 24 they don't really know too much about the military so like it's our job to pretty much like put it out there all the all the benefits that we offer opportunities job opportunities education opportunities that we can provide uh like right now the propensity level to serve is 10 percent, which is like the lowest since like 2007 so it's been it's been pretty rough for us. So we're just out here trying to do our best. Yeah, that's interesting, you know. Um, so therefore, a few weeks ago, I read in the paper that uh, you were offering um, a, a, a join-up basis, a recruiting base, a rather recruiting, um, um, you know, bonus. Um, yeah. is, is that always been the case, or that just happened now? So before it was, you could. Uh, get up to a forty thousand dollar bonus, but they bumped it up to fifty thousand. So you're able to uh, get a signing bonus up to fifty thousand dollars, which is like a ten thousand dollar increase since previous years. Mm -hmm. And then like, we offer like other bonuses, such as like quick ship bonus if they leave thirty days, sixty days, ninety out from when they sign, and it could range from like two thousand to like about nine thousand. And like, there's many like different jobs that we offer. Each job has like their own bonus and it changes varies depending on what the army needs at that time. Well, some of them would be more than 50,000 then? Uh, 50,000 would be like the max. You'll have like jobs that offer $20,000. So like infantry would have like $20,000 just for the job. And then if you decide to go like airborne infantry, you'll get another 10,000. So it'd be like 30,000 altogether just for going airborne ranger, that combination. When do you get your check right there? No, after you finish your training for um, basic training and EIT for your job that you pick, uh, any additional schools such as ranger, you'll receive it after you've done all your training. Oh, you should wash out. Yeah, if you wash out, then you pretty much go back to the line with infantry. <laughs> yeah. And then the, the bonus changes, eh? Yeah. <laughs> but the time and service doesn't, doesn't quit there. You still have to deal with your contract. Well, what does the contract say? How long uh, do you have to commit, you know, to get a bonus like that? Well, it just depends on the job. Uh, in order to like qualify for bonuses, you gotta score a 50 on the ASVAB. Anything below that, you don't qualify for a bonus or anything. But if you score over a 50 on the ASVAB, uh, depending on what job you pick, like 
Search and Juliet, which is a fire direction uh, control. There, um, right now, it's fifty thousand dollars for six years. Six so, years. yeah, it just depends on like how many years you serve. Uh, if the Thirteen Juliet did three years, it could have been like ten thousand. So we go in our system, and when we're picking the jobs for them, uh, actually they pick their jobs. We help them like choose the uh, how many years they want. If they want three years for thousand or six years for forty thousand. It's all on the applicant. They make the decision. We're just there to help them. Well, that's the new army, isn't it? Um, you know, you're you're very flexible about it, giving giving them options. That's terrific. Makes it more attractive. Yeah. I, yeah, I, it do does. you require a certain level of education for these bonuses? Uh, some of them, yeah, you do need some college, uh, certain algebra classes. Um, may need like a higher education of like math just because like the medical field does deals with a lot of math so you may need like extra education but the army can help with that because we provide like tuition assistance like right now i'm currently like going to college trying to get my associates and i never thought i'd be going to college like ever so <laughs> like thinking in my head like i might as well i might as well use it yeah. sounds um, like you recruited yourself <laughs> <laughs> nah, basically, like, I don't know, growing, growing up on the West Side, like, I never thought, like, I'd be able to, like, travel the world, like how I've been. I traveled all, like, New York to the other end of Washington State, so we, me and my family, like, we visit Mount Rushmore, like, Niagara Falls, New York City, like, we traveled a lot. And I don't think it would be possible if I did it on my own. Have you done any tours in the in the, the Middle East, Central Asia? No, oh, which is like crazy because I'm in a combat MOS. Well, I was a 13 Bravo, which is a field artillery. So combat MOSs usually get deployed more, but God had different plans for me. So here I am. It's okay. It's okay. So question yeah. is, um, you know, how do you, how do you get to be a recruiter? I mean, if you're, if your MOS is in, um, you know, combat, uh, wake up one morning and you can change. Well, once you reach a certain rank, you got to have that, uh, like time in that rank to pretty much like progress to the next rank. Uh, I have to do a broadening assignment. So you can either become a drill sergeant or you can become a recruiter. Um, a lot of my buddies were getting picked for drill, but me and my family, I needed time with my family. So I dropped a recruiter packet and went that route because like drill sergeants, I give them all the props, but I need time with my family. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, it's all the time. Strikes me. This is more appropriate for you anyway, as a, a matter of personality. You don't seem like a drill sergeant person to me, actually. Um, you know, uh, Paul Francis, you seem like yeah, a, more, yeah. more of a recruiter than a, than a drill sergeant. <laughs> They're not the same personality, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't like yelling. Like yeah. even my soldiers, like they know if I started to yell, then something's wrong. So <laughs> I don't like to yell. <laughs> How long are you going to stay in this uh, this 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 uh, MOS? I guess uh, drill sergeant, rather the uh, recruiter MOS. How long does that last for you? So this tour is uh, three years long, but um, I can extend for a year if I like it, but uh, or convert to become a full time recruiter for like the rest of my time serving. But I kind of miss the gun line, shooting artillery. Like that's what I signed up for. That's what I like doing. Yeah. So. I don't know, it's all up in the air. Yeah, I think from, from the point of view of the Army, it's good to rotate people through so that yeah. you are doing something, you know, you're doing other things, other specialties yeah. <clears throat> uh, before you get to be a recruiter. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, the the way you engage with um, you know, possible, um, you know, soldiers, 
uh, who, who enlistees, if you will, um, you know, what is it like? What, you know, are you going to tell them what, what, what they're about to get? Um, and I like to hear it uh, in terms of the benefits. I like to hear it in terms of the, you know, the education, especially because uh, yeah. to put in six years and uh, now you, you, you know, you might choose to get out. I guess a lot of them do. Um, and you want to be trained so you can get a decent job, you know, in the civilian world. So if the army can train me on some technical thing, uh, then I'm much better off at the end of my six years because I'm now I'm six years older. You know? uh, yep. So query what, you know, what sort of benefits, what sort of education can I get? What, what kind of schools um, would you would you say that I could go to when you are recruiting me? So. Like if you enlisted as a 68 whiskey, which is a combat medic, after you finish your training as a combat medic, you're pretty much a certified EMT. So you can like be uh, going to like reserves uh, just so you can go to college, um, go to reserves as a combat medic, come back with your EMT. So that that's like a big chunk of change that you just saved with all that like college that you have. Uh, you also earn college credits while you're in training and basic, and then uh, from there, you can use the tuition assistance, which is uh, 4,000 a year, and that replenishes every year. If you use it, you use it. If you don't, then it's gone. So this is you while I'm in the service. This is in service. I can go to college in service with this yes. program. Yep. Oh, that's and then great. From there, yeah, it, from there, after if you do decide to get out, that's when you would utilize your GI Bill to cover the rest of your education. So you can get a pretty good degree off of just the tuition assistance alone over a six year course. Yeah. And then I'm a veteran and I get veteran administration VA benefits, right? When I get out, yeah. I can get more, more benefits for education, right? Oh, with that, you get uh, your VA benefits as in like medical, like whatever medical problems that you acquired over the years of your service. And then like, I know like um, in Tennessee, where um, I was just stationed last, like they have uh, pretty much like this program where if your um, father, mother, or your guardian serve, if your kid graduates um, in a Tennessee high school, they'll be able to get like free education for two years. And that's not even, you can transfer your GI Bill to your kids too. So you can use the two years of Tennessee education for free and then stack on the GI Bill for your kids. So I got three kids, so that's my plan. No, that's great. That's very yeah. attractive when you, when you add all these uh, things up. And then uh, what, you know, what about the pay these days? If I go in as an E1, um, you know, what's it going to be like for me in terms of, uh, you know, um, A, my basic pay, be any special pay because I'm here in Hawaii. I don't know if there still is something like that. Um, if I have, you know, a wife or kids, uh, and what about housing? Yeah. I mean, what what kind of economic experience am I going to have if I'm say in my early twenties um, and I want to come in? What, yeah. what what can you offer me? So, well, it just depends on what you choose to. So, like, if you do decide to go reserve, you'll have part-time pay because reserves is pretty much part-time. And then if you do decide to go active, you'll get full-time pay. And with the active side, if you are um if you have a wife, kid, or dependent, uh, you'll be able to get BAH, which is a basic allowance for housing. And that basic allowance for housing just depends on where you're stationed. So like for Hawaii, you're stationed in Hawaii, like for me, I would get like 3,000 for just your housing allowance. And then, is, that, um, is that per month? Uh, per month. month is it? Per month? Yes. Oh, yes, wow. per month. Yeah, well, so, I could find a decent place for that. Yeah. Yeah. So 3000 for um, Hawaii when I was in Tennessee over there was 1500 for my BH. Um, what helps too is if you're Oconus, because there's Conus and Oconus. So Conus is like the mainland. Oconus is. Uh, Hawaii, Korea, Japan, Germany, anything overseas. So we, we're considered Oconus, so we get a uh, cola too, which helps. 
And that well, that's, thing, that's an extra kicker on top, yeah. Just just oh, yeah. to be away yeah. from the continental U US. Yeah, because cost of living over here is nuts. So yeah. It's true. I'm so gas prices so over here compared to Tennessee is unreal. Comparison, yeah. Yeah. So what what about uh, my my choice uh, duty station? Uh, when I come and see you and I say, look, I, I wanna I wanna go to Tennessee. Or I want to go yeah. somewhere in the country. How how specific can you promise me, uh, if at all? Can you can you arrange it so I go where I want to go, or is it is it up for grabs? So right now there's like uh, this program you can actually choose your initial duty location. So uh, we have Fort Campbell, Kentucky, where I just came from, Fort Hood, Blitz, which is in Texas, Polk, Louisiana. For Germany, New York, Joint Base Lewis Accord is in Washington and Alaska. Like you can choose those places for your first, your initial contract. So that's pretty good. Cause when I went, cause I was in the guard before. So I joined the guard three years. And then from there, like, I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta do something better. Cause construction was killing me. Like I got laid off in the labor's union. I had a wife, two kids, like, was hurting. Me and my wife was hurting. Like, we only had, like, $20 in our account. So, I yeah. in the National Guard, like, they started, like, I need to go active because I can't afford living over here. And then from there, we got a conditional release. Uh, talked to my recruiter, which is in Kapolei, um, which is I'm, I'm recruiting in now, which is weird. So, talked to my recruiter. And then they set me up for success. Got me a conditional release. My first duty station was in uh, Fort Drum in winter. I went from <laughs> 85 degree weather to 15 degree weather. <laughs> it could be worse. It could be worse. <laughs> could be. But from there, like. You know what they say? Yeah. There's two kinds of people in the service, okay? The two kinds of people in the service. One is the kind of person who likes his duty station, and the other, well, he doesn't like his duty station. And it usually it's consistent throughout his career, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, I showed up in New York with a T-shirt and shorts, and it was 15 degrees. I was like, oh, my God, what did I get myself into? <laughs> but it's all good. Like, I like, like the opportunities I had after that. I've been able to, like, yeah. Me and my family's like, we're living good. We have a roof over our head. The kids have food on the table. Their medical is taken care of, dental is taken care of. Like, I can't ask for anything else. As long as my family is taken care of, I'm good. Yeah, that's, that's great. So um, I, just, I just wonder, um, suppose a, a young young person walks into your office and says, uh, yeah, that's nice, but uh, I want to go to OCS. Hmm? I want to be an officer. Hmm? Um, you handle that? Uh, what, what what do you tell him when he tells you that he wants to be an officer uh, from officer's training school? Yeah. So for me, being the new recruiter, I've only, only been recruiting for like six months. I'll go to my station commander and be like, hey, boss, like <laughs> this guy's trying to go or his, or his girl's trying to go OCS. I need help. And then I'll get the mentorship. I never came across one personally myself, but from there, I would I would talk to my station commander. And they'll help me out with that situation. Well, it's, you know, if you have the qualifications for it, it sounds pretty yeah. attractive. You know, become an officer yep. right out of the box. Yeah, um, that is really good. I, I want. I wanted to ask you. The other thing is um, that uh, I have a lot of questions for you, Paul Francis. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, so you're in the army, okay? Look yes. at you. You're in the army. You're dressed in fatigues. You got your patches on. You're the army. What about the Navy? What about the Marine Corps? Um, there are other recruiters too, right? Do they are they shoulder to shoulder in the same office down the row? Where are they? And and do you compete with them? Well, there is a lot of competition between each branch. Like that's just the name of the game. But we have a new, uh, Navy recruiters right next door to us. Um, we help each other out too at the same time. Like if we can't process someone, we'll send to the Navy, see if they can process them. Like, I don't really, like when I talk to these kids, I don't really care if they go Air Force, Marines, Navy, as long, to me, as long as they have a plan 
of what they're gonna do after high school or just in general in life. Like, that's all I care about. I, I'll, I'll walk them into the Navy myself. I'll walk them into Air Force myself. Like, I don't care. As long as they have a plan, I'm willing to help them. Yeah, that's great. So I, I guess uh, some services are better for some uh, enlistees and some 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 not, you know? I mean, my own yeah. self, I, I went looking for a job in the service and I went to, um, you know, some recruiting offices back when I'm looking for OCS and they yeah. said uh, I, was, I was too short because I'm short. And yeah. um, and uh, they said, well, why don't you go down the road, go to the other one. They they don't care about uh, your height. And so that's how I got a job in that, that yeah. very way. One one recruiter passed me to another. Yeah. Well. So like with tattoos too, you know how like uh, for Hawaiians and like just Polynesians, we have tribal tattoos and we'll have it on our arms and this and that. Um, like Marines, they didn't take like tribal or like tattoos on their forearms, like they just change their policy that they can. So a lot of the times it's like, oh, Marines won't be able to help someone just because of tattoo. So they'll send them to us. And then, yeah, from there, process them, give them a job. You don't care about tattoos. Well, we do have policies on tattoos. Like you can't have it past your wrist bone. So like for my one, it is like up to your wrist bone right here. Mm -hmm. You can't go because you have to be presentable in uniform. Mm -hmm. And then like on your neck or face or head. Other than that, like you can have it a uh, full sleeve like me. And you can have it anywhere on your body. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, legs. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, I mean, we, we live, as I said, beginning of the show, we live in strange times. And yeah. um, sometimes, you know, uh, one political, geopolitical issue or another, um, somebody in Washington decides that you have to go somewhere. Um, and that could happen in Ukraine any day. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if there's troops that actually have been deployed, but there's a fair chance they will be, seems to me. Yeah. Uh, so, so how do you deal with that when somebody's coming to talk to you and recruiting yeah. himself? or herself, um, they say, will you, can you promise me I'm not going to a theater of war, that I don't have to, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to get shot up here. Um, yeah. What do you say when they ask you that? Well, I don't make any promises I can't keep. So I get to, I, I usually tell like it's all up in the air. Like me, I'm in a combat MOS, like we supposed to be deploying but I never deployed over the 12 years I've been in, all going on 13 years been in there. So there's times where some troops got to their station and deployed within a few months. But like, it's just all up in the air. I can't say anything about that. Like if it happens, I can't we promise them anything for sure, yeah. Yeah, but we do provide the best training, like, for them to be able to survive, you know what I mean? Like basic training, they're trained to actually take care of themselves and go through all the sh like firing ranges and grenade training and all that. So it's not like we're improperly trained before we do go. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, and that could be life and death. But uh, you yeah. mentioned earlier about uh, how some people get to be drill sergeants and all this. and. Can you tell me what it's like these days? Can we see all these movies, right? And they always depict, you know, the hard times. <laughs> yeah. In boot camp. What, but what is boot camp like now in 2022? What's it like? So you said times are ever changing. Back in the day, it was they'll punch you, beat you, pretty much drown you if they, if they find a puddle. But now it's when I went, it was more of the screaming, which I'm used to. I'm from the west side so it's like the screaming yelling that's nothing to me and then in my <laughs> thing like it's got to be worse got to be worse and then it's not so it was easy to get through basic like you just got to get past all the yelling but that's how they train you yeah, like, yeah, yeah. if you if you panic and you're home if you go to war you're gonna panic and like just stay in one spot no you gotta move yeah move shoot shoot back turn fire but yeah, and then now it's like some of the recruits that um was that called my, I got drill sergeant buddies. They're like, man, it's not the same. Like generation 
change. And it's kind of like <laughs> out there now. Yeah. Well, how, how long is it? Through eight weeks? And I, and that sticks in my head, but is it more or less? It's uh, nine weeks and then like a week of processing. The processing starts before the basic training, making sure it pays right, mm -hmm. making sure your beneficiaries are taken care of and all that. Your, your, uh, if you're getting like um, your, your dependents, mm -hmm. making sure they're is good uh housing allowance because once you go to basic training if you're married or have dependents you get housing allowance for wherever you're at so when i was gone for basic training my wife pretty much saved up all the bh that we made over here so when i came back from basic training like we're pretty good yeah yeah it pays you got to manage Got to manage the situation. So, what about you know? What about being in the army, being in the military these days? Um, you know, uh, what what do you say to them when they ask you? Is is this very regimented? Is this do I have to follow a lot of rules and regulations and stand at attention all the time and salute everybody? And um, you know, am I, am I going to be feeling like um, I'm 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 locked into something? Um, what, what kind of conversation do you have with them about that? Well, we do have a uh, military customs and courtesy. So yes, you will salute officers every time you see them in uniform, not, but what job, even in the civilian side, doesn't have regulations. You know what I mean? Like you can't wear it like Coca-Cola, Pepsi. If you work for Pepsi, you kind of get caught drinking Coca-Cola or you can't be, you know what I'm saying? So like, there's so much regulations that they worry about, but ours is more like traditional and like, you know what I mean? Like saluting, like how you said, yeah, it's tradition, but you also like learn like all the creeds and it gets like embedded in your head. And it's like you um, pretty much from the drill sergeants and all that get like broken down just to be built back up again. And it's not a, it's necessarily a bad thing. You know what I mean? Like I, I was a naughty kid back in the day. So it's kind of good to like get like built up to something better, more professional. Yeah, well, it stands you in good stead your whole life, really. You know, yeah. the other thing I wanted to ask you about is is the the relationships that you have. Of course, you know your commander is not likely to be your friend, but your you know the guys in your in your unit they're likely to be your friends and they're likely to be your close friends and give you comfort and help and you know become become friends that you remember your whole life uh, can you talk about that how is that now in the army I mean, so till this day i still have buddies from basic training and that was like 13 years ago and we still keep in contact the brotherhood sisterhood that you make in the army some of them last like forever some of them may not just because you may butt heads with somebody but for the most part you'll you'll meet people that you never thought you would come across like so many different walks of life um we exchange food in different ways like mexicans will cook something for me i'll cook some wine food for them and we just build like this trust that you would lay down your life for your your buddy, you know. So it just depends on like like the unit too. A lot of the time though, like I make good friends everywhere I went. Yeah. Well, so you know, one thing that strikes me is that uh, you know the the military has always been, especially in World War II, a melting pot. We get you know diverse group of people from all over the country, every race, creed, nationality, you know, everything. Yeah, uh, and which made at least in those days, it made the military a great thing, uh, socially and uh, culturally, and mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, I wonder how that is today. I mean, you hear sometimes you hear little stories about um, you know r racial uh, bigotry and the like uh, in the military, and of course outside as well. Um, yeah. But how how is the how is the military these days about that? If I'm if I'm in a minority. Um, you know, uh, am I going to have a bad time? Uh, does the military protect me if, you know, if people, uh, you know, do bigoted things against me? Yeah. So the military will protect you. Every unit has a 
sharp representative for sexual harassment and they have an equal opportunity representative. For my last unit, I was the equal opportunity rep. So what would happen is like if somebody feels like they're being like targeted or whatever, they come to me. I either handle the situation right then and there and make sure everything's good within my company. But if it's something like really bad, I'll bump it up to the next level and the brigade will take care of it. Um, we had like to put in a 4187, which is like this form that you fill out that we would have to remove this person from our unit and send them to another unit just so we don't have that negative atmosphere in our, our company. That's not good for promotion, eh? If you if you have uh, been found to be um, you know discriminating against people, uh, that gets yeah. on your your record. You're 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 going to be uh, you're not going to you're not going to get promoted so easily. Am I right? Yeah, you're not going to get far, especially with that kind of negative remark. If it does, if your attitude doesn't change from then, you probably might just get kicked out. Mm. To, yeah. you know, and for that, that and sexual assault, like zero tolerance. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't complain about that. So, so you recruit these people for any number of years, depending on the circumstances, and say six years. Okay, what's the level of success? Um, you know, uh, what's the level of, um, you know, does it stick? Does it stick? In other words, do they have the kind of experience that hopefully uh, brought them in? And does that, is it work for them? And do they stay in or do they drop out as soon as their uh, obligated period of service is over? Well, honestly, that just depends on the person. I've like had soldiers that was like, they only had a three-year contract. They're like, sorry, I'm done. Like, I can't do this or blah, blah, blah. And I just talked with them, asked them, like, well, what's their plans, this and that. Come to find out, they don't have any plans. So they end up re-enlisting for another three years. And it's like, from there, they, they just keep re-enlisting over and over again. And they end up loving it. And then there's some that, like, are, like, full-on army, hua, hua, and then they just get out after one contract. It just depends on the person. Like... For me, I do it for my family just because the benefits are there, obviously. Uh, like I said, my wife, kids are taken care of, so I can't, I can't argue with that. Yeah. And you'll stay till retirement at 20, or you think you'll stay beyond 20? I'm trying. I'm trying. It's the combat ammo side is getting to me. Like, well, time is like the brass ring because, you know, you get benefits then and uh, you're still relatively young. Um, they get a check yeah. all the time. It's it's a terrific result. No? Yeah, thanks. thanks for calling me young. <laughs> I feel <old. laughs> Yeah, but if you do a 20, so that's the best thing about this too, is like uh, a lot of companies, you pretty much have to work till you're dead. Like 67, <laughs> yeah, really. a new age retirement. Like if somebody started off at 18, working till 67, like what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Yeah. Like, Army, if you join at 18, you can retire at 38 and then have like a retirement check every month and like set. So it's like, I don't know, it just depends on the person. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's very interesting. Um, and I, and I, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that um, the Army and all the services will figure out ways to bring in because I believe, as I was telling you before the show, I, I believe in national service. Um, yeah. not, not just because it's a job that, uh, you know, has benefits and, you know, lifetime benefits in so many ways, starting with education and ending with retirement, but also, you know, because it's national service. We all have to be yeah. connected with the United States, with the government. Um, we have to support yeah. the government. It means a lot, especially now when, you know, things are so upside down. Um, so I guess I, I, I want to leave you one last opportunity um, Paul Francis, to, um, to to speak to whoever might be listening to this to this interview, this talk show, and uh, talk to them about why they should consider the possibility of enlisting in either in the army or the other services. Uh, what would you say to them uh, to encourage them to take a look at it? Well, benefits wise, you have signing bonuses that will um, help you out after you finish your training. 
uh, traveling, you're able to travel wherever you want, as of right now, to any duty station that you want. Um, if you're looking for education-wise, reserves will be your best bet. Um, go to reserves, come back home to Hawaii, and then just knock out your college. And then from there, you can go to active or just get another civilian job with all the military training that you've accomplished. But honestly, like benefits is what the younger generation doesn't look at right now. Like you can make a lot of money, but if you don't have medical or dental, like it's expensive, it gets expensive. And showing up to like even pick up a prescription, the one prescription bottle I have was, I looked at how much it was, it was $350 for one bottle of pills. I'm like, I didn't pay a dime. The army covered that. So yeah. Wise, you only have one body. You gotta conserve it the best way you can. Yep. Yep. Well, I guess the last thing I want to ask you is how, how can they find you? <laughs> Suppose they <clears throat> would like to talk to you about it. How can they find you? Oh, so we're we're located in Kapolei. Uh, right across 7-Eleven and Zippies, it's uh, 1001 uh, Kamakila Boulevard, Suite 171. And there's parking on the post office side on the street, or there's a garage parking. It's called uh, Campbell Parking, and it's like a structure that goes downstairs. You can park in there, and it's free. And we have roaming security, too, so your car should be safe. But um, even if you want to just give us a call, we'll direct you to a closer recruiting station to where you're at. Okay. I'll be down. I'll see you. Oh, yeah. Well, last question is, you know, I mean, I, I'm older than most uh, than most people you want to recruit. But uh, is there, what, what's, the, what's the maximum age? You know, because if they're beyond a certain age, yeah. you, can't, you can't help them, no? Yeah, so before it was uh, 35 and you would have to ship before your 36th birthday, but now it's 38. So 38 years old, you can come down still, check it out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Paul Francis. It's great to talk to you. It, um, it makes me feel that there's, uh, there's really options here for young people, and they ought to consider that not only for the benefits, the education, and the possibility of um, getting really getting great jobs afterward, uh, plus the retirement possibilities, yeah. but also, also to serve the country. Very important yep. to all of us. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the all discussion. Right. Thanks for coming down. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you.